Okay, so a very warm welcome uh, to everybody who has joined this webinar. Uh, I am Manoj Kulval. Uh, I am the speaker uh, for the webinar today. Uh, and today we are talking about emerging operational risks. Uh, I am a co-founder and chief risk officer at Risk Spotlight. Uh, we based out of uh, UK and then we also have a subsidiary in India. Uh, and today is our uh, 10th anniversary uh, of Risk Spotlight. So we've been in business uh, for 10 years. So a great day to come and share this webinar uh, with, with you. Um, in, at, at Risk Spotlight, we provide a web-based content service around monitoring emerging operational risks, which is then directly related uh, with the topic uh, we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then we also provide consulting and training services uh, uh, around operational risk management for financial services organization around the world. Uh, and uh, our partner for this webinar is Empowered Systems, uh, which is a software company uh, which provides GRC and ERM related software. And we'll have Alex uh, Robinson who will be joining us uh, uh, in the session and you know, tell us a little bit more about Empowered Systems at the right time. Okay, so with that, uh, let's get started with the session today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, on, on the topics uh, I am covering, then yeah, please post them and then I'll, I'll try and take a sort of break so we can address those questions, uh, but we'll try to address the majority of the question in the last 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave some time towards the end uh, to go through uh, the questions. Uh, the recording of the session will also be shared. You will also uh, get a link to the uh, uh, PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation we are sharing today. So you don't need to make a lot of notes uh, in terms of yeah, just capturing what we are what we are uh, sharing today. You will get the video and the slides uh, of the presentation. Okay, so so let's get started then. So in terms of emerging uh, risk, uh, there are sort of yeah, lots of definitions, but I don't think that there is any sort of standardization of the definition yet. Uh, but just for today's session. Uh, I'm going to use sort of two aspects of you know what do I what do I mean by emerging risk? So the first aspect is where uh, emerging risks are risks which are not in your risk register today. You know, so and not only your organization but your industry peers also they may not still recognize or be exposed to these risks because these risks may only be uh, relevant. You know, sort of in the next two years, next three years, next five years. Uh, so, so that sort of is where we're going to cover some of those risks uh, in the session today, which will fall into, the, uh, into this particular category, where they may not be part of your operational risk register today, but you know, at the right time, you may have to add them uh, into the risk register so that they can become part of any uh, risk assessments you do, any scenario analysis you do in your organization. The second uh, category of risks I'm going to classify as emerging risk today is uh, risks which you are exposed to and your industry peers are also exposed to, uh, but something about this risk may be changing significantly in the near future. So, so maybe the likelihood and severity of these risks today may be low, but something around those risks is changing, which may increase the likelihood and the severity of these risks. Uh, and that's why you need to keep an eye on those risks because the uh, currently all the controls you would have around those risks will be based around the past information or understanding of that risk. Uh, but if the profile or the context of that risk is changing in the future, then you need to be aware of what that changes so you can then adjust your controls uh, to make sure those controls are aligned uh, with those uh, the changing profile of those risks. So those are the two buckets of risks I'm going to cover in the session today. Then uh, in terms of the business benefits of why do we need to monitor emerging operational risk? Uh, because of course, yeah, first thing is it reduces the blind spots in the uh, understanding of your firm's key risk exposures. So you need to be always looking for to see whether the risks we have in our risk register, is that the complete set or are there more risks you know, we need to add into your risk register? So if you're monitoring uh, emerging risks proactively, then you will have reduced blind spots uh, in terms of your risk exposure understanding. Uh, then if you're monitoring emerging risk, you also get more opportunity and more time to prepare uh, for how to deal and tackle with those risks, you know, you know, before it is too late. So, so you get, you know, sort of more time compared to other organizations who may not be looking at those emerging risks a lot in advance. 
And then of course, if you are uh, keeping an eye on all those relevant emerging risks, it reduces the likelihood that those risks will affect your firm's strategy and performance in any negative way. Uh, and all of that, you know, then gives you uh, gives your firm also a competitive advantage. So if your firm is better at monitoring and dealing with these emerging risks, uh, then you'll have a significant competitive advantage over your competitors who may not be looking at uh, those emerging risks uh, that closely. Okay. So those are some of the benefits on why monitoring emerging risk is important. In terms of some of the hurdles I have seen around monitoring emerging risk on what stops organizations from doing this effectively. Well, in some organizations, I've seen this attitude where, oh, we have identified these 120 operational risks, and now we just need to focus on these 120 operational risks. We don't, we don't need to go and look for other operational risks out there. So if, if that is the mentality, then of course, you know, nobody's going to look for if there are any new risks, maybe there is 121st, 122nd risk, which also needs to be added into the risk registers. This is one sort of hurdle I have seen in some organizations. In some organizations, I've seen the hurdle where the board and the senior executives, they're not interested in emerging risk because some of these emerging risks you're talking about, which may be relevant in the next three years, five years time. And if the board and senior executives are just interested in, okay, what are the top risks now? Or maybe the next six months or 12 months, they may not you know, want to spend a lot of time on risks that may be relevant in three years and five years time. And then of course, you know, organizations then would not spend that much time on monitoring emerging risk if that is the attitude of board and senior executives. Another one uh, I have seen, which is, yeah, I think the most common one is resources where most operational risk teams are resource staffed. So uh, most operational risk teams hardly have resources to look at today's risk exposure. So of course, you know, they don't have the time and the bandwidth to invest in monitoring uh, emerging risks. Another uh, hurdle may be that if emerging risk is not part of the risk management framework and process documentation, uh, then of course, you know, nobody's going to look at those emerging risks. So, so to address that, uh, you need to ensure that there is some reference to emerging risk, the importance of monitoring emerging risk also into the risk management framework and processes. In some organizations, uh, I have seen that, yeah, they have uh, bandwidth, they have resources, but maybe they don't have the capabilities uh, because you need a certain amount of skill sets to be able to go and find these emerging risks and to monitor these emerging risks. And it's, it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea in terms of monitoring these emerging risks because these are, you know, sort of way out into the future. So you need to have a little bit of a research mentality, you know, to be able to find and uh, identify details around these emerging risks. So maybe the team doesn't have those type of skill sets uh, due to which you know, they, they're not able to effectively monitor emerging risk. And the last one is that uh, the teams are not aware of the information sources that uh, we may have the people, we may have the right capabilities, but where do we go and find these emerging risks? And that sort of you know, then becomes the hurdle because if I just go on Google and type emerging risk for banks, you know, I'll get 100,000 pages and then I have to you know, scroll through that to try and understand you know, which emerging risk should we think about or consider. Uh, and that's not a good use of the time uh, in terms of identifying emerging risk. And, and that's where Risk Spotlight you know, has addressed that last hurdle. Uh, and and we, when we saw about uh, seven years ago, when we started the Risk Spotlight portal uh, as our web service, which I'm gonna talk about more later, that is what it's trying to address, that uh, we bring all the relevant information for you to monitor emerging risk in one easy to use platform. So you don't have to go and then hunt out information about emerging operational risks. Okay. So those are sort of, yeah, some of the hurdles around why organizations may not be effective at monitoring uh, emerging risk. And then the last one I want to share before we dive into the actual operational risk related topics uh, is what approaches I have seen in organizations. So in a very handful of organization, I've seen where organizations have set up a central team to monitor all types of emerging risks. So that team is responsible for monitoring strategic risk, operational credit market. So they look at all the risk categories and there is a dedicated team uh, sort of in the second line whose responsibility is to monitor emerging risk. Uh, so they're always then sort of yeah, looking into the future and trying to identify those risks 
across all the different risk categories, but there are very few organizations here where I have seen that. The second uh, common one is dedicated central team to monitor emerging operational risks. So if you know credit market and the other teams are not interested in emerging risk topic, then I've seen in some organizations, at least the operational risk teams have uh, uh, created a dedicated team of one, two, three individuals who are then uh, responsible for monitoring the emerging operational risks. And that is typically part of you know, the op risk team. The third sort of yeah, common approach I have seen is where yeah, within the op risk team itself, uh, there are dedicated individuals, you know, and most likely they like uh, their time is dedicated to say that, okay, go and spend 25% of your time in a, in a given month or a given quarter on monitoring uh, operational risk and the rest of the time, you know, they have to do then their normal second line responsibilities. So that's, you know, another approach I have seen in organization or that sort of is the most uh, common approach where emerging operational risks are monitored. And then in majority of the organizations, yeah, it's still a new topic. Uh, there, there is, you know, uh, uh, so probably I would say 70, 75% of the organizations would probably fall into that last bucket where it's not being monitored in a dedicated way. So it's sort of, there may be some ad hoc approaches, some discussions around that, but there is no dedicated team or individuals uh, assigned to monitor operational risks. So with that, uh, let me then go to sort of the main section where we are going to talk about some of uh, these operational risks, which should be on your thinking radar for 2023 and beyond. Uh, so I'm sort of going to use that as the as the context uh, that when you when you're looking at refreshing or what risks to consider for 2023 and, and maybe also for the next you know, three, four, five years, some of these risks may be in that sort of time frame. then that's what we're gonna cover uh, in this uh, particular section. So first, let me start with yeah, some risks which are already with us today, and then you know, they are expected to stay with us in 2023 uh, and, and maybe beyond 2023. And one of the big uh, topics around operational risk has been the Russia-Ukraine conflict, where we're, we are all aware of the sanctions, the cyber attack, the disruption to business operations, you know, particularly for uh, the Ukrainian banks and the Russian banks uh, due to this conflict. Uh, and then there's also the damage to assets. So the, the first four risks are sort of bread and butter, which depending on how the conflict evolves, that yeah, if, it, if, if the conflict expands, then these risk exposures would expand. If hopefully there is a end to the conflict, then you know, those first four risks may not be, uh, uh, the, the exposure of those risks may come down. Uh, over, over sort of 2023 and beyond. Uh, but the next one sort of, yeah, is the, is the severe economic recession. So at least in Europe right now, it is a given that irrespective of whether, yeah, that conflict ends or doesn't end in 2023, Europe is going to go through a very severe economic recession. And then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that uh, a little bit more because that on its own is also a separate driver. It's not just the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but higher inflation, the high, uh, higher interest rates in the US, there are many other drivers which are also driving the economic recession and then what operational risks would get uh, affected uh, as a result of that. So I will touch that topic later. Uh, if the conflict sort of yeah, stays, uh, uh, if, if, if it continues for a large part of 2023, then you know, there is also likelihood of civil unrest in countries uh, by the citizens you know, who, in the countries who are supporting Ukraine. And we've already seen some of these uh, protests uh, in, in certain parts of Europe already. Uh, but if yeah, the, the conflict stays and continues for a period of time, then there will be a lot of pressure you know, from citizens on their governments uh, to you know, so, sort of somehow try and bring that conflict to an end. And that could you know, then result in business continuity, business disruption type risks uh, for the financial services firms in those countries. Uh, and one of the drivers also sort of emerging from this conflict is the reversing of the globalization. So for the last 15, 20 years, uh, there was more globalization happening. We had the, the supp a global supply chain where we had lots of vendors in lots of different countries and something this conflict and COVID, you know, sort of highlighted is that maybe we've gone too far in terms of our supply chain, that there is a lot of dependency on suppliers in lots of different countries. And the whole supply chain became very complex to manage. Uh, and, and with this conflict, uh, 
it, it is also driving that amount of reversing in globalization. So we're at least starting to see in manufacturing, for example, that a lot of manufacturing now is moving back from China, back to Europe and back to US to reduce the, uh, to reduce the dependency uh, on the supply chain from those countries. Uh, and in, in Europe and US, we already know there's a lot of focus on operational resilience in the financial services industry. And the regulators are very much focusing on the supply chain aspects of resilience. And, and one of the things organizations will need to think about if they have suppliers and vendors in lots of different countries, that that increases the amount of complexity uh, uh, in, in terms of operational risk. Uh, and one way to improve operational resilience is to reduce complexity. So, and, and this, the Russia-Ukraine conflict may become then another driver for organizations to consider that, okay, if we have vendors in 40 countries, can we rationalize that to maybe five countries or 10 countries instead of having vendors in so many different countries around the world? So, so we may start to see some of that getting affected and, and that will sort of unfold in, in the third party risk management aspect uh, of operational risk. And then, of course, uh, there are talks of new geopolitical conflicts, which may start in 2023. And the main one uh, in the geopolitical circle is around the China Taiwan conflict, which could be, you know, five, 10 times more complicated and more severe than the Russia Ukraine conflict. So, so hopefully our political leaders you know try and avert that and we don't have to deal with that but as operational risk management practitioners you know we need to be sort of aware of that that if that was to happen then there are some very very extreme scenarios which may unfold in terms of operational risk management so it should be on our radar we should be looking and analyzing uh, the potential impacts of uh, that conflict then on this slide, I want to highlight uh, uh, some of the articles we have in the Risk Spotlight portal. But uh, before that, let me just talk a little bit about the Risk Spotlight portal so I give you a context. Uh, so I mentioned that the Risk Spotlight portal, if I just go to our website here. Uh, so from our website, I can go to the content page and then I can go to the Risk Spotlight link here. So this is the web content service we provide for monitoring emerging operational risk topics. Uh, and we have over 100 financial services firms which utilize this today to monitor emerging operational risks. Uh, and this is what this offering looks like. So if you subscribe to this offering, uh, you go to the home page and, and you can see that yeah, this is where we have also partnered with Empowered Systems, which provides the software uh, to enable uh, this particular service. Uh, we provide to our customers. But this is where you can see news articles. So we track and update news articles on a daily basis where those news articles are related to operational risks in financial services firms. So that sort of is the main focus. So if I click on all news articles, this is where you can see we have 68,600, 693 articles over the last seven years. And then those articles get classified as loss events. So if I click on loss events, this is where then you can see any loss event which is happening anywhere in the world, which we identify, we go and capture those articles so you can then see what's happening in the world around internal fraud, bribery, cyber risk, data breach, and so on. Uh, but we also classify articles as emerging topics. So if I click on emerging topic, and this is the more focus around the emerging risk topic we have today, where uh, if somebody's done an analysis of certain types of risks and they, they're sharing that finding or somebody has documented some best practices on how to manage ransomware risk, for example, then those are the type of articles we categorize as emerging topic. And you can see there's 41,129 articles we have today and new articles are getting added every day. Uh, so you can come and uh, always find the latest information uh, around emerging operational risks. And what I had on the PowerPoint slide uh, was the operisk radar. So this is where we have 90 topics we monitor. So like you can see the first topic is the ESG topic, which is again, a big topic we're gonna talk about later. So if there are any articles related to the ESG topic, then we you know, capture that here. So you can see there are 208 articles related to that. So I can click on 208 and then you can, all, you can see like an ESG newspaper in this case where you're able to then see what type of news articles are getting published 
around uh, that particular topic. So we were on the Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, topic. So that's where this topic is here, the geopolitical conflict. And we have 589 articles. So if I click on that, then you will be able to see the news articles. And again, we are not covering the war from a BBC or a CNN perspective. We are covering the conflict from an operational risk perspective. So we will only include articles where it was relevant for operational risk management. So you won't come here yet to monitor what's happening in the actual war. You will go to BBC or CNN uh, to get that type of news. But if you are interested in analyzing how does the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, affect operational risks, then this is the only place in the world where uh, you can get that information because according to my knowledge, nobody else organizes this type of content in an operational risk management friendly format. Okay. Uh, and uh, everybody, uh, I think most of you are already subscribers to this because uh, I, I've seen some of the names there, but if you're not a subscriber, uh, then you can get a two month free uh, subscription to the portal. Uh, so, so you can register, you don't have to put your credit card details, so you, know, you don't have to worry about canceling it after two months. Uh, you can utilize the content yeah, I am going to share today, and then if you like the content and if it is useful, then you can uh, decide to uh, purchase the subscription, and then I'll just quickly uh, bring up yeah, the different options we have for subscription. So you can subscribe for one user, £990, you can also buy a team subscription, and you can also buy a corporate subscription. Okay. So that sort of is the offering I am, and because yeah, it's it's the main basis for all the research we have done for the session today, I wanted to highlight that. Uh, so this is where you'll be able to see those articles. And I included that because if you get the PowerPoint slides and you want to read through those uh, headlines later, then I wanted to include it in, into the presentation. But I'm, I'm not going to go line by line on the headlines. The next sort of a big topic which has been with us is the COVID pandemic. Uh, so again, at least the World Health Organization has said that you know officially they may announce the end to the COVID pandemic as such because the severity, the number of cases, the number of deaths, you know, has gone down significantly. But the risk is still there. So from an emerging risk perspective, there is still the risk of emerging variants because there are variants coming all the time. But luckily, so far the variants are not as powerful. Uh, or dangerous, uh, but that risk is now with us you know, for a very long period of time where uh, we'll need to keep an eye on those emerging variants. And you know, if a, a dangerous version emerges, then we're all very well aware of the health and the business disruption impacts uh, that can bring. Um, one of the things related to this from a health and safety perspective, you may wanna be aware of is the impact of long COVID. So people who did get infected with COVID, they, you know, they have recovered, but not fully. And, uh, and these symptoms are now called long COVID symptoms. Uh, so there is a lot of focus at the moment, a lot of analysis being done on, okay, what does that mean uh, from a health and safety perspective? Uh, so you may want to, you know, sort of look at that to see how many uh, staff members in your organizations are suffering with that, because that may then affect the health and safety related risks uh, and business continuity related risks in the future. Another uh, one is the civil unrest. So we, we saw a little bit of that in China where definitely the big consensus globally now is not against uh, that if there was an emerging variant, we don't wanna go in lockdown again. Uh, and, and that's where if you know, that was to be proposed in the future, then definitely there'll be a lot more civil unrest uh, in the future iterations of the lockdown than uh, we have seen in the past. Uh, and then one of the risks, you know, which then comes out of this whole crisis, which will again, like stay with us for a period of time is bioterrorism, because now uh, the, the bad actors have seen how much damage, you know, uh, a COVID type pandemic can cause globally. So, so there is a serious threat now of somebody intentionally you know, causing a similar type of uh, crisis in the future, and that that will fall into that bucket of bioterrorism. So, so you may want to at least look at that risk when you are uh, doing your scenario analysis, for example. Okay. So that is the uh, COVID topic, uh, and I have also then highlighted yeah some of the recent articles uh, we have uh, around uh, COVID into the portal, uh, and you can see yeah still. 36,000 cases being reported in China there on the third uh, article. 
but yeah, these headlines are there for your reference later. The third one uh, is around ESG. So because of at least the Russia-Ukraine conflict, ESG sort of yeah, took, uh, uh, got a little bit of a sidestep this year. There was not as much discussion as was happening before uh, the COVID crisis and before uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, but, uh, but definitely, you know, it's a big topic which is still around and we still need to focus on it. So in terms of operational risks, uh, some of the topics uh, that may be relevant from an operational risk perspective is the business disruption by the ESG activists. So we've seen cases in London, for example, where uh, the climate protesters protesting outside the Lloyds of London, outside the London Stock, Stock Exchange, uh, where which then causes sort of yeah, the business disruption. And we're starting to see more and more of that uh, uh, globally. Uh, then cyber attacks uh, by ESG activists. Uh, so that's where, you know, that's another type of potential risk uh, where if an organization is seen to be not supporting the ESG values, uh, then they could be tar target of cyber attacks by the hacktivist, you know, so these are hackers or like activists, but rather than protesting outside your building, they will protest by launching cyber attacks, you know, on the organization to get their message across. Uh, we've already seen yeah, continued pressure from investors and shareholders and BlackRock, you know, has played a big part there uh, in terms of forcing organizations, you know, to sort of incorporate ESG at part of business strategy and that pressure is not going down that pressure is you know sort of going to stay at that level and maybe even increase uh, going forward uh, and then there's also a big reputational impact around uh, the risks of decisions you know so if somebody finds out that a major bank has given a big loan to a coal company or to a a, a company which is not environment friendly uh, then that decision will get, could get significant media scrutiny uh, in in the press there's a lot of regulatory initiatives going around uh, encouraging companies to do reporting on ESG, but because it is such a new topic, there's a lot of uncertainties in organization on how they should be reporting those topics. Because if you don't report, you know, you're in trouble. If you report something and then the stakeholders don't like what you have reported, then you're still in trouble. So there will be a period of, you know, maybe two, three, four years before a norm or a standard is established. And until that time, you know, organizations will be forced to report something, but then whatever you report, it is possible that there could, there could be a potential pushback in terms of the information which has been communicated because the way it is interpreted, may, may, it may be in, misinterpreted, you know, by the stakeholders, or they may say it is not enough and they want more. So it'll be very difficult to sort of win that battle. Uh, so, so teams which are involved in that ESG reporting they may want to sort of yeah, look at the operational risk aspects around those reporting and the, the reputational impact that can generate. And there's also a lot of regulatory focus on uh, ESG related misconduct practices. So this is also referred to as greenwashing where organizations are saying, oh, we, we, this is a green ETF or a climate friendly ETF. But actually when you look at the investment that fund is making, then it's nothing to do uh, with ESG or it's nothing to do with uh, climate change uh, related practices. And regulators are coming very harsh you know, on that uh, at the moment in UK, in Europe, and also in the US. And, and related to ESG, there's also a significant increase in the frequency and severity of natural disasters globally. So now we have data for the last two, three years where every year it has been a record in terms of the damage caused by natural disasters. So, so that is expected to continue and that'll affect the business continuity related risks in the organization. And at the same time, uh, the insurance premiums are also increasing around that risk. You know? So then the cost of managing those risks from an insurance perspective are also increasing. So that's another sort of topic to keep there on the radar. And then we have in the portal uh, also articles. So we're tracking the ESG topics, you know, so this is where you can then go and find more uh, of the latest article and the latest thinking in the industry on uh, that particular topic. So at this stage, let me uh, pass to Alex Robinson, who's gonna come and just talk about what Empowered is doing in the ESG solution space. So let me, I'll stop sharing here, Alex, and I'll, I'll let you share. Thanks, Manoj. I hope you can hear me all right. Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Great. I'm going to share my screen. 
and hopefully you're seeing that okay as well. Yes, I see, um, yes. Brilliant, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, Empowered ESG, uh, one of the Empowered System Solutions Manage mentioned us earlier, um, and how uh, emerging risk can be incorporated into technology and into solutions to help with it managing the ESG emerging risks specifically. Um, so emerging risk can come from many different places, as Manoj has discussed uh, quite a few of them, and you'll see lots of uh, the, the, the points that are made on the slide here, uh, Manoj has already talked through. But as Manoj says, businesses and organizations need to understand where these ESG emerging risks are coming from and, and how they can efficiently eliminate the risk or take advantage of the opportunities for better functioning and sustainability of the business. Um, ESG risk management includes the analysis or management of the business's environmental, social and, and other governance practices and the impact of all three factors on the business. And additionally, ESG management is an opportunity to analyze the progress of the business. Awareness in ESG has increased significantly in recent years, uh, as Manoj has touched on, with many companies now required to publish ESG reports in, in some form, although, again, as Manoj said, it's, uh, there isn't a, a strict format of those yet. Um, ESG performance is becoming essential to all stakeholders, so investors, lenders, customers, employees, government agencies, etc. It's become essential to these stakeholders to know the position of the business and its ability to survive in the long run. All of this means that monitoring emerging risk becomes even more important in the, the ESG space. Um, so just picking on a couple more of these points on the slide, um, looking at investors, for example, uh, Manoj mentioned investors are looking for sustainable opportunities with investments into sustainable funds increasing from $5 billion in 2018 to nearly $70 billion in, in 2021. Regulators and governments are expanding their focus on incorporating sustainability into investment information. Uh, and there's growing recognition that ESG research and analysis can help identify investment risks and opportunities. Uh, suppliers, for example, suppliers are being asked to demonstrate ESG responsibility in order to win business more and more now. Um, and ESG perception is becoming increasingly important for customers and employees. Um, and Manoj touched on the regulations. ESG regulations are evolving quickly. Um, regulators and governments are using ESG frameworks to help develop better regulation, knowing that they have a sound basis thanks to the involvement of globally established experts in those frameworks. There are a large number of frameworks, though they are converging and consolidating. Um, for example, the TCFD task force on climate related financial disclosures, the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, um, it's necessary for some organizations to be able to follow and make disclosures for multiple frameworks. So a risk management approach to ESG is a, a key element in these frameworks with TCFD, for example, it requires a, a number of disclosures around how the organization identifies, assesses, and manages climate-related risk. So how can technology, how can Empowered ESG help with understanding the effects of emerging risk on an organization? Well, our approach is to first define uh, an ESG strategy through building out uh, strategic objectives. Then these objectives are mapped to all the elements of an organization that influence or are influenced by those objectives. And then the, the news and events, the articles from expert content providers like Risk Spotlight could be filtered and, and contextualized for each element of the ESG solution. Then a, a comprehensive risk management capability and, and a framework is embedded into the solution to manage any identified risks. So just going to a little bit more detail there, to provide that flexible approach, um, Empowered ESG has adopted two popular management frameworks, the balanced scorecard and objective key results for managing ESG objectives. So the flexibility enables the organization to establish, monitor and maintain the overall ESG vision or strategy uh, whilst being adaptable to changes brought about by emerging risk within the commercial ecosystem. So the approach aims to uh, provide a more comprehensive view to stakeholders by complementing financial measures 
with additional metrics that gauge ESG performance in more operational areas. So having established the objectives, um, these are then measured by key results, which can be cascaded through the organization for monitoring throughout. Key results recognize that progress is an evolution, not an immediate thing that you can switch on and uh, they give a tangible way to measure progress at operational intervals uh, towards more lofty ESG goals as part of your strategy. They also provide a focus for identifying emerging risks to achieving our overall ESG objectives. I'll come on to that in a moment. Key, res key results are supplemented by um, indicators for more detailed monitoring and initiatives supporting their achievement. And in turn, those key results can be mapped to those evolving regulatory obligations um, and the, the ever-changing ESG frameworks to provide evidence of progress towards attaining compliance with the individual requirements. So the objectives and key results, as I mentioned, will measure progress towards achieving uh, the ESG vision. Uh, and they also form the center of an organization's ESG activities as determined by the ESG framework. Empowered ESG is, is based on a powerful knowledge management solution, which enables the mapping of the, the key results and objectives to all the different activities, ESG activities that can influence them. Um, providing a unique management perspective of, of everything you need to see. So, for example, the regulatory obligations and policies that the key results or objectives will affect can be viewed directly from the key results themselves. Uh, An organization's services, products, processes, etc., are the business impacts that the key results relate to. Um, empowered ESG's GRC route mean a, a very strong risk management capability has been embedded into the solution to help with identifying, assessing, treating and managing risks and opportunities that are associated with the key results we touched on before. Climate related scenarios um, can be analysed with the full knowledge of the areas of the business they could affect, enabling uh, resilience assessments and tracking resulting actions. Uh, a library of third parties with risk assessments um, could be mapped to the key results and the uh, objectives that they influence, and they'll help identify how your supply chain is affecting your ESG objectives. Uh, and finally, GHG emission assessments are also captured and mapped into the key results to help progress towards your ESG vision. So how does this flexible approach relate to the managing of the emerging risk? Well, the emerging risk information is related to all elements of the ESG solution uh, that we've seen in, in the previous slides. And Empowered ESG provides uh, the ability for filtered and relevant news and events and articles, um, all that information displayed to the users for each element of the ESG solution, depending on the perspective that you're looking at. So curated content like risk spotlights can be viewed from each of these perspectives. So, for example, horizon scanning for evolving ESG framework changes or regulations relating to a specific product or service, or the sentiment or perception of third parties in your supply chain. Um, Empowered ESG gives you the, the structure to monitor, identify and understand the risk that may emerge. Furthermore, it provides an understanding of how the evolving risk landscape will affect your ESG strategy and objectives. Um, and it gives you the capability to be able to manage those risks. Empowered ESG um, builds on empowered systems, long history of connected risk GRC solutions. Um, as I've discussed, it includes the, the power and capabilities of our risk management solution and has built in connection points for integration with multiple other GRC modules, as you can see on the screen. All of these modules can benefit from the same emerging risk information and, and management capabilities that, that we've been talking about. So for example, uh, looking at the uh, ESG frameworks and obligations, um, we can integrate that with full regulatory change management capability so you can monitor and um, assess the impact of all of the uh, regulatory events that might occur. So to find out more about 
any of uh, Empowered ESG solution or uh, integration with any of the, the many connected risk solutions, some of which are shown on the screen here. Please take a look at our website, um, empoweredsystems.com. Um, and with that, thank you for your time. I'm going to hand back to uh, Manoj, who can tell us more about um, emerging risks in other topic areas. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's then continue uh, our discussion on the emerging risk topic. Uh, another uh, topic here, which, which has started in 2022, but we'll feel the impact in 2023 would be around the significant interest rate increases, particularly in the US, uh, is where if we if we go into this liquidity crunch, is where uh, we may start to see internal fraud emerge. And, and recently, I think FTX was one of the biggest example where a lot of internal fraud was happening, but you know it was not exposed when all the markets were doing well. But as soon as you know these interest rate rises hit the liquidity crunch and then impacted the value of the assets then you know that internal fraud was uh, uh, was revealed and you know then the whole exchange and its uh, sister company uh, had to file for bankruptcy but but this is normal for any sort of recession right so whenever there is a recession we may find that yeah things uh, which were not discovered during the good times are discovered and and internal fraud sort of is one of those areas to watch out for uh, if we do start to see the recession and the impacts on the on the liquidity of the organization, which is also the second point here that uh, regulators are now waiting to see whether uh, this this drain of liquidity, which has been caused by the interest rate increases, does that cause a liquidity crisis for a financial services organization? So could we have another Lehman Brother in a type of an event? And, and regulators are keeping a very close eye on that. And, and there was a near miss, at least in UK, where the Bank of England had to step in, where uh, certain pension funds were facing liquidity crisis uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and and that sort of yeah made various regulators rethink the the strategy, uh, but it is possible that yeah if those interest rates increase or if they've already increased too much and uh, those liquidity effects are felt in 2023, then from an operational risk perspective, those liquidity crises could quickly overflow into the disrupting of the business operations. Uh, another one is around the conduct risk. So things are going to get really tough if, if we go down into recession, then things are going to get tough and it's going to be difficult to get revenue and profit targets. And that's where if organizations put a lot of pressure on the sales team to achieve the revenue and the profit targets, then you could see uh, re-emergence or occurrence of conduct risks like mis-selling uh, happening within the organization. So something to watch out for uh, when you know things get tough uh, from a sales and profitability perspective. Uh, if there's a lot of cost cutting which happens, uh, then of course uh, operational risk will also get impacted where we, uh, operational risk individuals who are involved in implementing various controls you know, may be laid off uh, and that may then reduce the overall effectiveness you know, of the control environment. So from an operational risk perspective, you may wanna keep an eye on where those costs cutting are happening. And if they're happening in important areas, then you know that if the effectiveness of control goes down, then we need to keep a much closer eye uh, around those risks. And if the, the uh, recession sort of yeah, results in uh, employees having to announce redundancy or let employees go, then there's always that risk in that context of unfair dismissal, uh, where you know, certain employees may think you know, that uh, their dismissal was not fair, and then there may be legal cases against the organization uh, around uh, those redundancies. So that's you know, sort of another thing to watch out for if we sort of yeah, do go into a deep recession in 2023. Then another uh, area which has been with us for some time, but there has been yeah, significant changes this year and the speed of change is only going to get, uh, only going to increase is around artificial intelligence. So from an operational risk perspective, where this is relevant is uh, where artificial intelligence is getting integrated in the core business processes. So if we are issuing credit cards to customers and then AI model is making those decisions, then you know, sort of, yeah, we need to, uh, we, we could be exposed to certain risks, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, 
if the, uh, the AI models can also be integrated in the core products and services. And similarly, the operational risks teams can also be using AI to enhance the operational risk management processes. So maybe some of the control testing or some of the control assessments can be automated by using AI where those control testing and control assessment may be manual today. And, and that is possible where uh, in areas like technology risk where we may have a lot of data around the implementation of the control available and it may be possible to automate some of the testing and assessment of the controls for IT risks. So those are sort of three application areas where from an operational risk perspective, AI is relevant. And from a trend perspective, the effectiveness of these AI technologies and the amount of use cases where AI is deployed is only increasing rapidly. And, and we don't have time in today's session, but I, wa I wanted to sort of yeah, introduce, uh, you'll see on LinkedIn or Twitter, there is a lot of discussion around chat GPT at the moment uh, where a company called OpenAI has published a AI model where you can have a chat with a AI uh, model. Uh, and, and there are some interesting results which are being published on Twitter and LinkedIn around how human-like the responses we are getting uh, from that model are. And it's free, so you can go uh, to the OpenAI website and try that out for yourself. Uh, similarly, Stable Diffusion and DALI2 are other things. Also, you may want to Google search uh, where they, they demonstrate how quickly AI is evolving. And both of these platforms, they basically can create a unique image based on the word. So you type certain terms and based on the words you type, it will those applications will using AI they will go and create a unique image which never existed in the world. Uh, and, and then you can use those images in your presentations, for example, and we'll start to see a lot of marketing teams, you know, will start using those images also uh, produced by those models. So, so the speed and the effectiveness of the AI technology is only increasing. And as uh, operational risk practitioners, you know, we want to keep a very, very close eye on how our organizations are utilizing AI. But it's not only the organizations, the, the cyber criminals are also using AI. So one of the big threats as AI becomes more powerful uh, is that yeah, we, can, we can use AI internally to improve our processes and effectiveness of those processes. But of course, cyber criminals will also use AI and those cyber attacks could become more large scale and more sophisticated uh, going forward. So in terms of the scenario analysis, the severity of those cyber attacks can be significantly higher than what they have been uh, in the past. Another area where AI is uh, specifically uh, posing threat is in the deep fake technologies where you're able to create a, a exact replica of a person's voice or a person's uh, video, uh, a person's image in a video, and that can be used for committing fraud. And it's becoming really difficult when you look at some of these videos to identify whether you're looking at the real person or you're looking at you know, the, the deep fake version of that person. Around the models I talked about, uh, there, there could be uh, cases where if the AI model has not been trained properly, then the AI model may be making some decisions on whether to offer credit card to certain type of customers, or it may be making decisions on what credit limits to offer to what customers, and that may, uh, be, uh, that may be resulting in some discrimination. And, and we've seen a case with Apple and Goldman Sachs where with the Apple card, the AI model Apple was using was biased towards offering less credit limit to uh, females compared to males. And then there was a case against Apple and Goldman Sachs around uh, that discrimination the model was doing in making those uh, decisions to offer credit limits. So, so that's as, more, as we use more models where we're making those decisions about which customer to offer product to, how much should we offer, then there is that risk of discrimination you want to watch out for and monitor uh, closely. Similarly, there are some AI models where they just make the decision uh, and then the AI model doesn't give you an explanation. And from a regulatory perspective, if there was a regulatory audit and the regulator comes and says, okay, tell us how did you make decision to offer mortgage to this customer? Uh, and if that decision was made by an AI model, the AI model may not provide you an explanation and then it may get difficult sometimes to explain why did we make a certain decision to uh, uh, do something in a certain way. So that's another risk, you know, from an audit trail perspective, 
we may want to uh, have on the radar. Uh, the next one is around increasing level of automation. Yeah, so if, if, we, if we use more and more of the AI models and we automate more things, then of course, yeah, when they are running, they're fine. But when things fail uh, or if there are errors happening, those errors may be undetected for a long period of time. So by the time you find out something is wrong, you know, it may be many days or many months uh, and you may have a big backlog of errors you may have to go and fix. So that automation, you know, sort of also brings its own challenges and risks. Uh, to the organization. And the last one is around discrimination where, you know, because we started using an AI model and we have to let, uh, if humans were doing that activity previously and now we have to let uh, those people go, then there may be, you know, a case of discrimination or unfair dismissal where if we compare to, to say that, okay, you were only able to do so many cases in a day and now this model is able to do 10 times more cases, then there is a chance of, you know, sort of unfair dismissal or discrimination case by the employee. So we need to be careful in terms of yeah, how that gets communicated within the organization where AI models are replacing what humans were doing uh, previously. Then uh, let's sort of yeah, expand the radar a little bit. So some of these topics we've talked about, yeah, they're relevant today and they will be sort of yeah, relevant uh, over uh, 2023 and beyond. Uh, but some of the new topics uh, is around the digital assets. Uh, so this is sort of a little further on the radar, uh, but we already see that there are a lot of financial institutions which are already doing a lot of activity in this space. And then uh, by digital asset, you know, it is also referred to as crypto asset, you know, sort of in the, in the general uh, public. But if you look at the regulatory documents, industry documents, then it, it is also referred to as digital assets. And, and, and this is sort of yeah, a big sort of movement happening on the side. It is still not come full scale into financial services. So it's still new for many financial services organization, but you already see the, the leading organizations are already dabbling and playing in that space. And Fidelity particularly has done a tremendous job in a way they have a dedicated team uh, uh, for digital asset and they're providing uh, services to allow retail customers to trade, you know, Bitcoin, for example, they're also providing custody services. And, and they've been doing this since 2019, uh, from what I can remember. Uh, and NASDAQ, the stock exchange in the US is also launching a crypto custody service, which will then allow you to buy these digital assets, but then you don't have to store them, you know, personally, you can store them uh, with NASDAQ. And that is an area where many uh, financial services customers are looking for those opportunities where they want to become the preferred provider of custody uh, for uh, these digital assets. Okay. So, so there is a lot happening in this space, but very few financial services organizations are doing this, but it is only going to, uh, uh, it is only going to come and disrupt more and more in the financial services uh, industry in 2023. And the main reason is because the regulation is coming. So right now, because the there, there is little regulation around the digital asset, main, major financial institutions have stayed out but various global regulators in Europe, in US, Financial Stability Board, there, is, there has been a lot of discussion around uh, the regulation around this asset. And as soon as that regulation comes in, that'll give financial services organization the certainty they need. And that is going to just expand the adoption of these digital assets. And more and more financial services organizations then would start offering uh, products and services around these digital assets. And a big change coming there is the Europe, uh, uh, the European regulation called MICA, which is Markets in Crypto Asset. So this is already in draft phase, already in consultation. It's gone to many various uh, stages, and it is going to be finalized at some point in uh, late Q1, early Q2 next year. And that will give a regulatory framework of how organizations can get involved in crypto assets all across Europe. And that's going to be, you know, a big uh, a tick for the financial services organizations to now start getting involved in this space. Uh, similarly, the Bank of Inter International Settlements has this consultative document out, which they published in June, where one of the ideas proposed was that banks can keep 1% of their treasury reserves in Bitcoin. So it was, you know, it was acceptable to do that. So it depends on yeah, whether those consultations go in the right direction. Uh, and we also have a US where the White House, uh, the president 
released a, uh, a executive order for all US government departments to prepare the strategy on how they are going to adopt, promote, regulate uh, these digital assets. So a lot of the groundwork has been done in 2022 around these regulations, and these are going to get finalized and implemented in 2023, which is going to then significantly increase the amount of activities financial services organizations are doing in this space. And that's where it poses a challenge for operational risks. So these are some of the operational risks which may not be on your radar today, but you, if your organization starts offering, then there are these new risks you need to start adding to your risk register. And whichever teams are then involved in selling these digital assets, uh, you'll need to help them to manage these risks. So one of the risks is around the external fraud, uh, where organizations can start offering uh, uh, credit cards, which are based on cryptocurrencies. So you're not uh, buying with dollars or pounds or euros, you're buying with Bitcoin or Ethereum or one of the other tokens. So that's what the credit card is based on. And then the same type of external fraud we have on dollar, euro, pound, credit card, the risks would be same, but the context, the nature, the ways in which it'll happen could be very different. And the type of controls we may need around those risks uh, may be very different. Similarly, if your organization starts offering custody uh, of the cryptocurrencies, then you know you will. One of the risks you will be exposed to is protecting those uh, assets of the customer. If the if your firm gets involved in trading of cryptocurrencies, then you know market manipulation, uh, and then the sort of exchanges where these digital assets are traded, you know, may be different to Nasdaq and other uh, exchanges, and that's where. Uh, a risk around market manipulation will need to be managed. If uh, you are a pension fund and then the pension fund decides to invest some of the uh, uh, portion of the funds into cryptocurrencies, digital assets, uh, and, but then those disclosures are not made correctly to the investors, then you know there are risks around that which will need to be managed because digital assets are sort of considered as high risk assets. Uh, so there will need to be a lot of disclosure uh, if investments are being made into those uh, areas. And similarly, if your organization starts integrating with uh, the different blockchains, then uh, you may have to change your IT systems to go and interact with different blockchain. And of course, that change management will then bring its own set of risks, uh, which you will need to manage to make sure that those changes you know, sort of don't go over budget, don't take a lot of time but also those changes are secure uh, and are able to handle customer transactions and customer assets safely. And as more uh, of financial services organizations do this, of course, there, uh, there is a steep learning curve for the operators community to start becoming familiar. If you've if you not you know, sort of looked at this space at all, uh, then from an emerging risk perspective, at least we want to start learning about some of these concepts so that if our organization starts uh, uh, dealing in this space in 12 months time, 18 months time, as a team, we are ready. We don't have to go and hire people from outside. Uh, and and there, are, there are not going to be any people from outside because this is such a new topic. There will be no experts. So everybody you know, has to learn from scratch uh, on this particular topic. So that sort of is a big calling you know, for the operational risk professionals, compliance professionals, internal audit professionals to start learning about digital assets. And if you are new uh, to this topic, then I've highlighted sort of yeah, the 30 most commonly used terms, which you know, you'll at least need to know if you want to understand the basics of digital assets. So, so you can go and you know, sort of yeah, search for these on Google. There's lots of information on Google, lots of videos on YouTube on each of these uh, different topics. But I at least wanted to give you, you know, sort of some keywords that if you don't know anything, then at least you can use these 30 keywords and then they'll take you in the right direction. Uh, around understanding the technologies and then you know, starting to understand the operational risks around those uh, technologies. Another sort of similar topic is the metaverse, um, which again, sort of, yeah, is like two years, three years, four years down the, down the horizon, but organizations are already you know, doing, financial services organizations are already doing a lot in this space and that I've just highlighted some of the examples here where JP Morgan has opened a branch in the metaverse where you can go and visit that branch and you can you know, sort of yeah, do some interaction. 
uh, HSBC, you know, has also entered uh, the metaverse. And there's a lot of South Korean banks. So South Korea always ahead from a technology perspective. So many, uh, there are many South Korean examples uh, you see here. Uh, so this is another sort of yeah, emerging uh, space in terms of where financial services organizations would go. And then of course the operational risk will follow wherever financial services organizations go. And I wanted to highlight sort of yeah, some of the concepts we know today and how sort of they would evolve in, in the metaverse world. So we have physical branches, our customers are using phone banking, chat-based customer service, they're using mobile banking. We're selling insurance, loans, mortgages for purchasing real uh, world assets. We're doing online meeting with customers. We're doing online meeting with third parties. We do lots of internal online meeting with the remote working teams. We have lots of training courses for our employees. We may do sales and marketing events, you know, to, to get more revenue, get more customers. Organizations may be doing conferences, you know, for the different stakeholders. And then, of course, organizations are doing shareholder meeting every year, you know, with their, their shareholders. So these are some of the aspects we are familiar with today where there is a communication happening with key stakeholders inside or outside the organization. And that's where Metaverse will, uh, can change the, the, the nature of that communication, which may happen in the future. And that's where in metaverse, there are these two concepts, so virtual reality and augmented reality. So virtual reality is you're wearing those headsets. If you've seen like Oculus, the Facebook uh, headset, where you wear the headset and then sort of you experience uh, a virtual reality uh, inside that headset in form of apps or software. Or there is augmented reality where those are like Google glasses where you can see the real world, but then something gets overlaid on top of that. So, so, so that's where there is competition on whether virtual reality is going to be more adopted or augmented reality is going to be more adopted. But in either way, there is a much richer experience you can create for your stakeholders by using the metaverse technology. So that's the advantage of why organizations want to go into that space to improve that level of engagement with the stakeholders. And, and that's where organizations will have, you know, virtual branches and banking services. So instead of going to a physical bank branch, you'll be able to visit a bank branch of JP Morgan in the metaverse and then interact with the staff in that virtual bank branch. And then that virtual staff branch can be a person somewhere in India, or it can be an AI ro robot. It, it may not be a person at all uh, in, in the metaverse branch. And similarly for banking services, you know, rather than doing the phone banking or mobile banking, uh, organizations can provide those services in the metaverse. Organizations will also create their virtual buildings. So like you have meeting rooms where employees can come and have a meeting, uh, board members can come and do a board, uh, board meetings. Similarly, uh, organizations will be creating their virtual building. So there may be a virtual Bank of America office or Barclays office in the metaverse where employees then go to work. So physically they may be all at home, but you have to go and uh, work in the the virtual uh, office space in the metaverse. Uh, so, so, and that's where there's, there's a lot of assets coming. So there will be architects who will be helping create virtual buildings. You'll have to buy furniture uh, in, in the virtual building. You'll, have, you'll be buying paintings uh, and uh, projectors and video presentation kits uh, in the virtual world. So, so organizations will be then investing a lot to build their presence in the metaverse. And like we provide insurance, loans, and mortgages for buying real world assets like cars and homes, uh, organizations will also be providing insurance, loans, and mortgages for buying digital assets. So if I want to buy a digital home, I may you know, then go to my bank and get a mortgage to buy my digital home in the metaverse. And then banks will you know, sort of uh, have to provide that offering and value that uh, mortgage and then you know, decide what interest rates they want to charge. Similarly, uh, organizations will be able to customize the products and services based on the customer's digital identity, because right now, yeah, when somebody walks into the branch, you don't know who they are. So you have to ask, okay, can you give me your debit card or your account number? We ask for some identity. Uh, but in the metaverse, uh, because they would already have done the authentication to enter the metaverse, you will already know their digital identity. And that gives a lot of opportunities then to customize the products and services firms will be able to offer to their customers. And then of course, uh, it'll enrich the online working environment. So, so while with remote working, yeah, people are locked in on Zoom and yeah, Zoom is great, but it's still a 2D experience. It's not 
a immersive experience, uh, but by you know working as a you can still work as a remote team, but if you're doing your team meetings, uh, if you do those in metaverse, they can you know they can be better than the face to face meetings in some cases, depending on how much has been invested in creating that experience uh, by the firm. And from a learning perspective also, yeah, it's going to change dramatically. So all those risk and compliance training we do today, which in a very boring 2D way, there'll be lots of opportunities for us to make those training a lot more interesting, a lot more immersive, so that people actually remember you know, what, they, what they learned in that compliance and risk training uh, in the organization. And this sort of yeah, poses another learning curve uh, for the operational risk pro uh, professionals. Uh, so we need to sort of yeah, start getting familiar uh, with these concepts and see you know, which part of the organizations are looking at this space or if they're not looking at it now, are there plans to look at this in the next six months, in the next 12 months so that the operas teams you know, can then be ready uh, in having those discussions uh, at the right time. And these are then some of the risks you know, organizations would be exposed to. So, so there'll be current cyber risks like ransomware, phishing, data theft, online fraud. So they will still stay in the metaverse because it's still the internet. It's just a new version of the internet. And you will see in the media, it's also called as Web3, that right now we are in the Web2 world, but with digital assets, crypto and metaverse combined together is what uh, the media is sort of referring to that combined experience as Web3. So of course, these risks we have in the physical world will sort of morph and change in how they happen. So we'll have to then adopt our controls to mitigate uh, the, the new context around how those risks are happening. Similarly, theft misuse of customers' digital assets. You know, so we will need to uh, have that risk into our risk register. Similarly, if we have digital properties and assets we have bought on the metaverse and we paid half a million, one million pound to build an office in the metaverse, we need to then protect those digital properties and assets in the metaverse. So that'll become another risk uh, or new risk we'll be exposed to. Right now, there's a lot of discussion around the VR headset and the men physical and mental health uh, aspects related to wearing those VR headsets for many hours. Uh, so but right now we have very few people are doing it. So, but that's a very active topic of discussion that if we want more and more employees to start doing this, then what are the physical and the mental health impact around spending so much time in the virtual reality world rather than the, uh, the actual world. And then of course the data privacy risks would also change because yeah, we'll be getting a lot of data about people who are, who are visiting our branches about uh, uh, employees who are attending those remote work meetings. So data privacy, the nature of those risks will also change. Uh, and the conduct risks such as mis-selling, discrimination, harassment, those would also get affected in depending on yeah, how we're doing selling of our products and services in the metaverse. Uh, and then the harassment of it can be either of the customers or could be the employees who are attending those, uh, those virtual meetings. Okay, so those are uh, some of the examples. And the last one yeah, is money laundering, where uh, of course the way in which money laundering will happen in that digital world, you know, maybe in a very different context using different currencies rather than dollars that may be you know, in Bitcoin or Ethereum or other uh, digital assets. And here are sort of three reports. If, you, if you're interested in learning more, then the first one is by JP Morgan. Uh, the second one is by Europol, where they've already started identifying some of the law enforcement type risks, where they're focusing on money laundering, fraud uh, type risks. And the third one is by Visa, you know, where they focus particularly on what metaverse means for the financial institutions. Uh, so, so those sort of, yeah, you can look for the name of those reports on Google and, and find those if you want to learn more. Then uh, the last slide, so I just want to highlight then some of the topics and then we'll, we'll leave uh, uh, room for uh, questions and answers. So uh, we'll leave 10, 15 minutes for answering those. So one of the areas yeah, which is going to continue to stay in focus is the operational resilience where you know, UK has already enacted the regulations, Europe uh, has operational resilience. Uh, also adopted various operational resilience related regulation, US is doing the same. So that focus is going to continue in 2023 and beyond where regulators are going to be focusing a lot more uh, around operational resilience. 
Another topic we have seen sort of through our news article is increase in the amount of hacktivism and protest wear. So hacktivism is where yeah, these are activists, but rather than yeah, standing outside your office uh, and protesting, uh, they are you know, sort of protesting in form of cyber attacks. And, and protest wear is then specific software which is getting created to disrupt something in the organization. So, organize, so you know, uh, cyber experts may create some software and then you know, that software can be implemented or deployed to cause disruption to the organization they want to target as part of the protest. And one of the big things uh, which we have seen in that space is that uh, Ukraine cre has created an IT army of nearly 400,000 global volunteers who are cyber experts from lots of different countries. And then they came together uh, and uh, the last statistics I, I saw, they stopped like nearly 40, 45 cyber attacks from Russia that they helped the Ukraine government uh, against uh, protecting from cyber attacks. And then some of these initiatives also involve, you know, sort of yeah, launching cyber attacks against Russia to steal document information, to get information about, you know, their resources and their plans uh, in terms of attacks and so on. And, and never has that happened sort of yeah, in the past where so many cyber risk professionals came together for sort of yeah, one cause and it's a volunteer, so nobody's getting paid anything. Uh, but Ukraine was able to sort of yeah, create this large global group. Uh, and there's a lot of articles. If you search for Ukraine IT Army on Google, you'll find there's a lot of articles uh, associated with that. But of course, now that that idea is out there in the future, the same idea then can be implemented against a particular organization. If you know, a certain group of people think that organization is not doing something along their expectation. The next one is around uh, whistleblowing. So uh, at least in US, yeah, there has been a lot of focus on rewarding uh, whistleblowers. Uh, so in 2022, SEC rewarded nearly 229 million to various whistleblowers who reported misconduct, uh, illegal activities in their organization. And what was interesting was that these whistleblowers were not only from US, but there was a lot of whistleblowers from outside US also who were working for a US organization. But they were working outside US and this is a record, you know, so, so 2021 was a record year and 2022, you know, was also a record year. So, so the strategy in US is to use greed, you know, to cut greed where they, they then reward the whistleblowers a certain amount of uh, fines they were able to impose uh, based on the information shared uh, by the whistleblower. But in, in Europe also, there is the whistleblowing regulation, which is now in the process of being implemented across the different countries. So, so there is sort of yeah, a lot of emphasis and focus on that particular topic, which is going to continue in 2023 and beyond. Ransomware is another sort of yeah, big topic, but uh, uh, I think there is enough out there in the media. So I'm not going to go into yeah, too much detail here, but it's, it's going to sort of yeah, stay as the top five uh, risk in, uh, in many organizations, at least from an external uh, awareness perspective. Another uh, big topic we've seen from the articles is around the concentration risk with large cloud providers where you know majority of the financial services organizations are concentrated in either using Amazon Web Service or they're using Microsoft Azure Cloud or maybe one more. So there are three or four cloud providers who are then supporting large amount of financial services organizations and most regulators yeah, sort of have realized uh, that uh, that is a big risk because uh, Amazon, Microsoft, they're not under the regulatory jurisdiction. So now, uh, at least in Europe uh, and UK, there is uh, intent you know, to sort of classify and bring these cloud providers so that uh, they can share more information uh, and then regulators can be convinced that, yeah, uh, if there was a disruption, it won't cause a disruption to the wider financial system. So there's going to be yeah, more initiatives and uh, talks around the risks, the concentration risk with the large cloud providers in 2023 and beyond. Another uh, big topic we've seen from the news articles is cyber attacks through the supply chain. You know, so now organizations are not directly targeting banks, but they're now targeting third parties used by the banks and then trying to, uh, uh, trying to launch an attack through the third parties. And there has been yeah, a significant increase this year, and that is expected to stay 
uh, uh, stay as high, you know, sort of going forward, because in most of the major organizations, at least, yeah, there, there are adequate cyber security controls inside the organization, but maybe their vendors and third parties still don't have the same amount of robust uh, security around those cyber attacks. And that's why uh, they've become, you know, sort of this target and they'll continue to be uh, the target of those attacks. So those third party risk management, you know, then becomes a very important topic. And then, of course, we are doing a lot of remote working and hybrid uh, working where most financial services organizations have now agreed whether, you know, we're going to do two days in office, three days in office, and the rest uh, employees can work from home. And then we're using technologies like Zoom and Teams and Slack and uh, other collaboration tools. Uh, and now cyber criminals know that, you know, there's a lot of in valuable information which is being discussed and shared in those, uh, in those meetings using those technologies. So of course, those technologies then become a prime target, you know, for cyber criminals. So again, protecting uh, the information yeah, we have uh, in those discussions which are happening, uh, and then just yeah, making sure uh, that those meetings are not hijacked and the information then goes outside the organization will continue to be, you know, sort of one of the significant risks uh, going forward. And then the last one, uh, which is sort of yeah, on the radar from a long-term perspective is quantum computing, where uh, quantum computing and particularly a protection around the encryption security we have that a lot of security we have today uh, could be broken very easily if quantum computing becomes a reality. But yeah, it's still early days, but again, the pace at which that field, that technology is growing, uh, it's sort of, yeah, is a sign of worry uh, that if a, if a, uh, a criminal actor or a threat actor that gets access to that technology first, then yeah, there can be you know, sort of significant consequences, you know, not only yeah, for financial services firms, but also you know, for the other firms. So it's just a topic you wanna keep an eye on that it's not a big threat right now, but it has the potential that as soon as it gets close to becoming real and widely adopted, uh, it could become a very serious uh, operational risk topic. So that sort of yeah, brings us to the end of what I wanted to share. So this is, again, I've already talked about the Risk Spotlight portal. You can go to the website. If you're already a subscriber, you can sort of yeah, see these topics and articles related to the topics I've talked about. Uh, but if you're not a subscriber and you're interested in understanding more of the topics we have talked today, then there is a two month free, no obligation trial, no credit card required, uh, where you can register and then get access to uh, this content. So with that, let's then look at some of the Q questions which have been raised uh, and then feel free to ping questions. So we'll then use the rest of the time we have uh, to answer these questions. Uh, so I think the first question is around emerging risks are more important than anything in the risk register. Uh, agree, yeah. And how are you getting boards to understand that? Uh, and so, so in terms of your yeah, making that understand to the board, one of the practice we've seen, uh, at least to customers who use a Risk Spotlight portal, is that if you are produce, if you're creating a uh, a quarterly report for your risk committee and your board around the key risks where you highlight, you know, the top ten risks and the controls and so on, then we've seen some of our subscribers have added a section in that report for emerging risk, and that's where then they use some of the content. Uh, uh, from the Risk Spotlight portal to include in that section to show to the risk committee that the operational risk team is not only looking at what's happening inside the bank, but it's also looking at what's happening outside in the industry. So that is sort of is one approach we've at least seen with some of the uh, Risk Spotlight subscribers. But in terms of yeah, trying to explain them the benefits, it'll really be yeah, the chief risk officer and the head of operational risks you know, that they need to do that selling job on why those emerging risks are important. Um, and you know, if the chief risk officer and the head of operational risk, if they are not able to communicate that effectively, then it will be a tough job. Uh, and then there's a question around, yeah, do you also cover up risks for non-banking financial institutions? Uh, so at least in Risk Spotlight Portal, yeah, we don't. So Risk Spotlight Portal, 
is mainly focused for financial services. We do cover articles for other industries, so like the British Airways data breach, for example. Uh, so data breach, you know, you can always learn from a data breach wherever it happens, whether it happens in a bank or financial services or industry or outside. So we will cover those type of articles if a bribery related article happens in another industry. Uh, but the focus always is on, is that content relevant for managing operational risks in financial services firm? So, so that sort of is our primary audience. So you will find in the portal content, but uh, it, it may not be complete in terms of complete coverage of operational risks for other industries. Then there was another question on, are the articles white papers from ORX and the like taken into account? Uh, yeah, so we are, because we're not a financial services organization, we can't be ORX members. Uh, so, so we don't get access yet to the ORX content with the members get. Uh, but if yeah, ORX does publish, you know, a report or an article, which is then freely available on their website, then definitely, you know, if that is relevant for our subscribers, we would incorporate, but we monitor, you know, 500 different sources, you know, on the internet for different types of risks. So we have sources for fraud related risk. We have sources for cyber related risk. So, so our net is yeah, much wider in terms of trying to get the relevant articles and our uh, geography focus is G20 countries, you know, so that's where we're trying to look for articles in the G20 countries uh, in the portal. But yeah, if ORX will publish something which is uh, not behind, uh, which is freely available on their website and if it's relevant for our audience, we will include that. Uh, okay, so let's then see what is the next question. Oh yeah, so one question is an example of Russia conflict, the risk of sanctions, cyber risk should already exist. Why is it an emerging risk? Yeah, it should already exist in your risk register, but the scale, the likelihood or severity of those risks could change depending on you know, whether yeah, that conflict becomes like a nuclear conflict, then you know, th there could be a lot more sanctions. So then because the nature of that risk can significantly change in 2023 is why I included that. But you're right, those risks should already be there uh, on the risk register today. Uh, another one is, okay, so my view of emerging risk are that we have limited view on the scale and controls in place. Yeah, so that I think goes to that, those two types of risks we talked about. Yeah, so one category of emerging risk I've covered is here, which are like brand new risks. They don't even exist on the risk register, but they are very few, right? So there's very few risks, which will be like brand new that we've never encountered. So a lot of the emerging risks are enhanced version of what we're already facing today. So, so we have lots of external fraud and there may be a completely new type of external fraud, which may come in 2023, but it's still external fraud. It will be like a variation of what we already know today. So a lot of those emerging risks, you know, sort of fall into that bucket uh, where they sort of relate to what we already know, but because the scale, the way in which they may happen may be very different, we have to learn about that and then adjust our controls to make sure those controls will be effective if the nature of those risks change. Uh, how would the ESG integration center for the risk mitigation of the third party risk uh, for of third party risk from greenwash perspective in connection to other GRC solutions? Okay, yeah, so I, I don't have Alex here, Michael, so I'm not able to answer that particular question. Uh, but in terms of yeah, the, the connected risk solution, it has a lot of integration. So if, you, if you're talking about that, yeah, you had your ESG data in, in the uh, empowered solution and you needed data from other systems to do your reporting on greenwashing, then there's a lot of uh, integrations provided by the connected risk solutions, which can be used. Okay, so that sort of yeah, covers all the questions which have been posted so far. Uh, I will stay here in case yeah, there are more questions and I'll, I'll stay here uh, for another five, 10 minutes to answer any additional questions. Uh, but if you don't have any questions, then thank you very much uh, for taking the time uh, to attend this session. Uh, you will get the link to the recording uh, and also the slides uh, we have shared today.
So thank you very much for your time and attention today.